really talk about the issues that need to be discussed. Well, no, no, I don't. I just would like to maybe re remind us of some of your points. Well, I'm not sure. it was wonderful seeing it uh, in such a beautiful print, original print, and it brings out a lot of the aesthetics of the original that I think amplify some of the things I was underlie, some of the things I was uh, talking about. For example, the simplicity of the iconography, the almost literalness and purity of, of the imagery and the way the characters are framed always in the act of looking and desiring and uh, the way the three heterosexual seductions and the two homosexual seductions are constructed uh, similarly uh, without without difference which is in itself uh, very queer and um, I think that also seeing it again uh, after a few years um, reminds me, uh, I think also um, bolsters my point about the documentary quality. Uh, I mean, it starts in very 1960s era fake verite, the workers' movement, and uh, the, the fake journalism of interviewing the workers and uh, uh, sort of acknowledging the political context of the year, uh, which was full of workers' occupations of factories in Italy, and uh, the growth of both the traditional Communist Party in Italy and also the growth of, sort of non-communist uh, left popular movements. Um, and Pasolini's point about the co-optation of the workers' movement is not his own unique original viewpoint. I mean, it was very much under discussion uh, at the time. The, 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 um, the um, impotence of the old left was very much uh, on people's minds and um, uh, the the alternatives to the old left were were emerging, whether in the students' movement or in the non-organized workers' movements. And at the same time, um, as you know, in Frankfurt, there were a lot of suggestions that traditional left politics were leading out desire, were that Marx needed to be brought together with, with Freud. And there were theorists like Marcuse who, who um, were writing books like entitled Eros and Revolution, who, who Civilization. Eros and Civilization. Sorry, Eros and Civilization. Well, then he wrote another book with Revolution in the title, didn't he? Anyway. Who, who uh, had a very similar argument to Pasolini's about the permissiveness of advanced capitalism and the tolerance of the post-sexual revolution West and how it was co-opting the revolutionary feelings of, of, of the day. Um, so, so um, yeah, I guess this context became much fresher to me, looking at the film again, of, uh, reminded of this uh, very st strong, uh, volatile political context in Italy that Pasolini was referring to. Um, I don't know, I'd like to hear from the audience. Yeah, no, you, that was fantastic. Thank you. For that. Yeah, Vincent Heidegger has a question. Yeah, Tom, I very much liked your point about um, censorship often being more to the point that not certainly the promotional discourse, but sometimes also the critical discourse. You, you quoted the Osservatore Romano and said, you know, at least these guys know what they're talking about. Um, 
and you quoted the Osservatore Romano in a review of the film where they characterize the Terence Stamp character as uh, a demon. Which you commented by saying, well, I prefer to see him as an angel. Um, and there's obvious, there, there's an obvious uh, dimension of spirituality from through the entire film, and it's clear that, you know, the angelic character of Terence Stamp arrives is an envoy of some sort, awakens everyone's desires, changes their lives. Um, could you comment a little bit more on that, what you said about the angelic nature of that character and how it relates to the issue of desire and of queer desire? Okay. Um, well, he's... Um, Painted like a medieval saint, for one thing. Those luminous close-ups of him staring in towards the camera or tilting his head uh, are, are very... invoke a whole sacred tradition of iconography. And his behaviors are so, so uh, consolatory and tender and he caresses the five family members so beautifully and comforts them and reaches out and touches them. And uh, um, this is not how a, a, a demon behaves. Uh, and um, he, he, he walks sort of around with an aura doesn't he? Uh, especially in the seduction scene with Lucia, is that her name? Um, the mother, uh, Silvana Mangano, with the, the, the framing of the sun over his shoulder. Um, so, so he's visualized in saintly or holy uh, garb throughout. Um, and the characters all recognize this in him when they give their speeches afterwards, their, their, their poems about how you changed my life. They don't, they don't uh, pick this negatively, do they? I'm a mess and I owe everything to you. You ruined me, but I'm so grateful to you. You, you made me realize what a idiot, an empty idiot I was. Right? So there's this kind of, no. Uh, so, so, yeah, there's th this discourse of gratitude and uh, of uh, salvation uh, that they, they feel towards him. Um, so bringing on in each person this crisis of, of self-recognition and otherness um, I mean, it's a very biblical kind of narrative, isn't it? Uh, uh, um, and uh, there's some argument about whether this is a New Testament film or an Old Testament film, but this this discourse of, of salvation is, is, I think, more, uh, even though uh, Asselin is quoting the Old Testament throughout, I think this discourse is much more New Testament at best. A, a, a discourse of salvation. Okay, there's a comment back here. Um, yeah, I also want to thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to ask, uh, in the first uh, half of the movie, there's one scene where they are sitting in the garden, uh, the three people, uh, the father, the young younger lady, and um, yeah, let's call him Angel. And uh, he is reading a book, and he is asked to read aloud. Um, I wanted to know: Is he quoting Ibsen in that moment? I don't believe it's Ibsen. I think it's Tolstoy. Okay. Um, I forget the name of the, the novella, but it's about about even idiots. Yes, and isn't that a narrative about a young man and an old man? A relationship of healing or, or comforting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a Tolstoy.
story expert, <laughs> not a Rambo expert. But. Yeah, otherwise I would have said uh, that would be a, a further hint um, to say to see the whole movie as a, a movie about sexual revolution uh, in favor of sexual revolution and against. Uh, I think you mentioned it, um, heteronormativity. Mm, but uh, yet, I'm not quite sure what to make out of these uh, religious elements that are constantly present. Um, I had an impression uh, for what's concerning the editing of the movie that uh, these elements are always introduced um, as a contrast to the scene before. and. Um, um, I read in a critic by Paolo Meleghetti, who writes for the journal Corriere della Sera. Um, he said uh, Pasolini wanted um, to express that uh, the bourgeois society has lost uh, its sensibility, its divine sensibility. And um, there uh, is the uh, how, cleaning lady of the house who runs away and uh, who is adored by the um, poor people and then the end uh, he, she walks away like Jesus with a disciple maybe uh, wants to be buried and offers herself to the world um, yeah but um, I'm not quite sure how to um, see this uh, last image where does this uh, lead for an interpretation Um, some very good uh, questions. I think Pasolini uh, was fascinated by the peasantry and uh, that, that class and their, their simplicity and faith and she's the character who faced with this provocation resorts to, to faith and abjection and uh, um, martyrdom, right? Um, uh, the mother, uh, the daughter, turns to catatonia, the mother to uh, gay male promiscuity, and uh, <laughs> the father to, um, well, you saw, um, screaming and giving away his factory, and then the son to being a, a, a radical abstract artist. Uh, so there's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek in all five of those options. Uh, and it's very hard to avoid a kind of tongue-in-cheek or camp reading of those options. Uh, even at the time, I mean, people were sort of gossiping that that um, Laura Betti got the Best Actress Award at Venice for allowing herself to be shoveled over with dirt. Um, and you have to really acknowledge this kind of campy aura to it. But on the other hand, it's possible to maintain all kinds of contradictory ideas and feelings about what is going on. I think he sincerely, intensely was interested in the religion and the religious faith and devotion of the peasantry. But at, at the same time, I think he was detached from it and, and critical of it. Uh, and so I, I don't think we can pin down everything about what's going down in the what's going on in the film. It is a very open film that allows multiple readings. I mean, he's working within the tradition of art cinema that encourages ambiguity and the critical vocation. Uh, it thrives on multiple, uh, on the critical institution and it's multiple readings and, uh, of films. It's, it's part, of, they're part of the industry and the art cinema uh, 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 wants discussion after films like this one. Okay, there's another question. I have uh, three points. Um, the first point is referring to Terence Stamp. Uh, do you know that was sort of a typecast in terms of he became famous uh, by playing Billy Butt and Peter Osnoff's movie. And Billy Butt is of course a very interesting figure in terms of homosexuality and so on. That's the first question. The second question is, even though I have to thank you for your lecture, I'm not really convinced, and I want to point out two things. The first thing is, I don't see a single scene in this movie where sex is 
unambiguous. It's a nice gender sex. There's nothing. There's nothing like, like a real crisis there. Okay, and the change is not a crisis. Okay, what happens with the people afterwards? And then another point you made in, in, in your lecture was saying, okay, there's a gender equality. I'm not so sure about this. If you look carefully at, at how the women react after the transformation and how the men react, there's quite a difference. Okay, so the men give themselves, they strip themselves, so to speak, they become artists or something like this. Whereas the women, they either become catatonic, they don't do anything anymore, uh, or uh, they um, they just uh, use uh, male prostitutes and so on. Okay, but they don't really give them something. Okay, they don't give them the money. We don't see it at least. Uh, uh, that's the wife, and uh, the servant obviously uh, becomes uh, goes into Hermitage, becomes also the same kind of thick person and so on. So this is sort of strange, don't you think? Um, first of all, the question about uh, Terence Stamp. Yeah, he was a hot young star from uh, the UK, and he would certainly have seen Billy Budd. Um, uh, his producer was probably overjoyed that he wanted to cast him because he would in increase the commercial viability of the film. This is how he cast his films with all these foreign, foreign young stars, Anton Wiesemski, for example. Uh, and uh, I'm sure Pasolini was not unmoved by his, his sex appeal. He did, he did just appeared, I think, in um, Far From the Madding Crowd. Uh, and was really, really hot, uh, commercially as well as sexually. So, good, good casting choice. Um, secondly, um, you're, you're, you're thinking about gender equity or gender difference. I think the seductions are non-discriminating, regardless of the gender of the five individuals, but of course, if the characters respond according to the options that are avail available to them within the patriarchy, uh, uh, I mean, I think that Silvana Mangana is Pasolini, and uh, uh, I, I think that, that, that whenever I, I watch this, this this, this episode, um, this, this is what comes to mind. Here's Pasolini driving around in his, he didn't have a little, whatever that car was, he had something else, but uh, this is what's going on. Um, so yeah, I, I think there is non-discrimination in terms of gender inter with the seductions, but of course, gender culture exists and he, he's aware of that, just as much as anyone. The other question about religion, uh, I don't think it's a contrast or an ironic opposition to the vestiges of religious institutions around all these people. Uh, you would have to argue that the Mozart Requiem is used ironically, according to your point of view. And it, you could not possibly argue that. It's used so intensely and authentically and <coughs> sincerely. He's making fun of the Mozart Requiem? No, I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or... There's a public thing to say, but anyway, that's um, And the, st the churches, the churches, uh, I think it's the, uh, I think in the image of the sacred that he is advancing, it's the ultimate apotheosis to get fucked in a ditch in front of a church. I think this is so transgressive, his image of the sacred, that it must contain that, that image. I don't think, again, he's doing an easy contrast between the, the, the uh, religious imagery on one side and the behavior of these secular people in late 20th century Italy uh, during the economic miracle. I, I don't think that's what's going on. Tom, wouldn't you want to add class um, in terms of gender that Pasolini certainly... Yes. You know, the, the gender equity example you gave us was from Arabian Nights, 
um, a different whole system, economic system, the, the way he looks at gender in relation among peasants may be different than the way he looks at gender in the bourgeoisie. So here, this is definitely, he, it's a critique of every single one of those family members. Um, perhaps not the maid comes out better, <laughs> but, but, but so in that sense, the, the maybe class here has to be worked into the, the gender well, analysis. Yeah, I think he distinguishes between the peasantry and the proletariat, and for mm -hmm. sure. We don't really see the proletariat in this film, except for the yeah. opening sequences where, where, where the union members are challenging the journalists about the bourgeoisification of, of the workers. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, of course, the class is inextricable from the whole social and narrative framework of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was just throwing that in so that the gender equity, um, so that in that sense we don't need to look and see and make sure that every single person in the family reacts the same way in order to say there's gender equity. I think that there's a different um, aspect to the critique going on. I just wanted to add that in before I move to Regina Pranga with your question. Yes, I, I, that's the same point I would like to touch on. Um, there's a a great difference between the reactions of the family members and uh, uh, between the reaction by Emilia, the maid, the maid. And I would would like to suggest that this is the point that he aims at the religious solution. That uh, uh, the, the Terence Stamp character is a, a modern Christ, of course, and he does his salvation task by he, he mediates uh, salvation by sexuality, and it's only the maid, Emilia, who, who is able to receive, to transform this divine impulse, because she is the only one who uh, is the founder of a society, of a community at the end. And she's adored by Pasolini's mother. <laughs> and this is, I think this is the culmination, uh, the, the, the climax of the film, because when, when Christ, this Terence Stamp character, arrives, he reads a book about civilization structures. I don't know which book it is. I would like to know who is the author. It's not only uh, Rimbaud, it's also a book about civilization, something like that. And so I think only Emilia is the real follower of Christ in this film. So she realizes uh, what he wants them to do. And she's the only person who does not complain about his departure. It's also very important, I think. So, so, so there's a class uh, question. So she's the subject of revolution, I would say, like Terence Stamp. I think he understands that peasants don't complain or don't get to complain in this context. Um, I would not privilege Amelia's story over the, the other four. Uh, I think he has a distance from all five narratives. I don't think hers is really special. I don't think he sees martyrdom and uh, assumption as as uh, revolution. As revolution. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting reading. Yes. I, I can add uh, her self-sacrifice at the end is, is kind of a uh, uh, repetition of Christ's self sacrifice, uh, uh, the enactment of passion, of course, and, and this follows uh, to her, uh, when, she, uh, when she meets um, Terence Stamp, she tries to commit suicide, and so at the end she realizes this suicide in a, in a way to, uh, to uh, create a community, I think, because that's the point, people assemble around this miracle. <laughs> She is, and when she is buried alive, she gets new. She she produces new life. So, so she's a kind of source with her tears. It's a it's a very <laughs> strong picture. Very strong. I, I think each of us has our own theorema, and I don't think your theorem is very 1968. And but you know, I I, I certainly. I think it's, 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 it's persuasive and I respect it. I, 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 I don't agree with you. No. <laughs>
are there other theoremas out there? <laughs> other comments or questions? Maybe, okay, there's a question. Yeah, I mean, I, I hadn't seen the film before and just, you know, reading about it and kind of having an idea of what I was supposed to see, I was rather surprised by how quickly all the seduction scenes went and how there was very little... Sometimes it happens really fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but of course, things can happen really slowly or in films it doesn't really matter. What matters is what just trying to, someone's trying to show. And I was just surprised at how little there was actually shown about the character of this person coming into this house, about these people all of a sudden being dragged out of their normal lives. And it was only sort of, yeah, the whole consequences of it afterwards that was in focus. And the whole thing about this kind of dramatic change that this person brought into these people's lives wasn't kind of discussed or dealt with at all. And I was just wondering what 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 is what would Pasolini be trying to say or something? Well I don't think he wants to flesh out the whole narrative and give the background and the character's motivations. It's 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 a parable. It's not a psychological drama. It doesn't really matter where Terence Stamp is coming from. And when you're hit on by an angel, you comply immediately. <laughs> don't you? Um, um, it's not about seduction per se. Uh, it's, it's about five erotic submissions, one after the other. There's the kind of rhyming or rhyming or uh, repetitive structure of a parable to it. We don't need to know why or the details of how it unfolds. It just happens. Well, yeah, yeah uh, it's it's not the, a character drama, uh, and uh, it's interesting that the Lucia's uh, going berserk with her her hustlers is. I mean, it'd be interesting to time the five episodes and see which is given the most time, but hers seems to go be given very special attention uh, in a certain way. Good, good point. Okay, okay um, thank you for your talk, and I want to make a point about the documentary character of the film, because I found the cities and the architecture is very important in that film, and the sound, because so often, or, or often, um, the, uh, the, the actor behave, and the sound is not really, it's the sound of a city, I got the impression it's not nature. It's it's every time like when you live in Frankfurt, you hear the um, the planes, the street, and it's it's a very industrial film, I, I think. And um, and the other point I found it maybe because of the sound that all the five characters are absolutely lonely. They don't interact, in, in my opinion. So I was very really impressed in in. Um, and the sound. Yeah. Um, very interesting point. The sound is all fake. Uh, yeah. The Italian industry in general, and Pasolini in particular, did not do uh, sing sound live recording. It was all post dubbed. And so very special care was taken in the lab afterwards to produce the soundtrack that you're referring to. I don't. I'm so caught up in what's going on on the screen that I keep forgetting to listen until Mozart blasts me out of my, my distraction. Um, but I think that I'll, next time I watch it, I'll, I'll listen for the industrial sounds. Yeah. Um, very good point. Is it um, I wanted to come back to the aspect of class and um, because I think there's uh, some kind of fundamental difference between um, the behavior of Emilia, the maid, 
and the bourgeois characters. Um, the bourgeois characters are um, um, seeking some kind of, um, I don't know, compensation. Um, in contrast to Amelia, they um, look for uh, the 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 Christ in um, in objects, in paintings, in in photographs, um, and and try to. They, they feel somehow incomplete without him. And um, I think this is a fundamental difference and in and, and the, um, like, also as in, in, a, in an aspect that the bourgeoisie cannot um, desire or create desire itself without the proletarian element. Like, yeah, like, you know, like, um, this is a, um, like the typical trope, like in Titanic, um, the, the the proletarian must fill the bourgeoisie with desire, otherwise the bourgeoisie can't live with with itself. Okay, so some interesting points. Yeah, Pasolini really respected the ank uh, the peasantry's anchor in their traditional culture and their their strong social. Uh, foundation and so I think that's why he understood that Amelia could go where she went and it's true I think he did see the the bourgeoisie as unhinged from this this kind of social uh, uh, foundation uh, and so the recourse of the of the artist or the the, the other options they exercise uh, I think you have an interesting point about them being connected to alienation and, and social uh, solitude. Uh, yeah. And what was your final point again? Um, oh, Titanic. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, the, the I, I think that's not a, a huge dynamic in this film, the, the interclass. Uh, Dynam uh, sexual dynamic, as it is in Arabian Nights and Decameron and Canterbury Tales and Sallow, uh, and probably uh, earlier films like Mama Roma and Akatone. Uh, yeah, so even though his he brings his boyfriends into this film, or his friend friends, uh, I don't think this is like a major a major thread. Of this interclass eroticism. Um, this, um, just I'll say one thing before I turn to Vincent. This, this time seeing the film, it, um, I became so aware of, on the one hand, the different, it seemed like different film stocks that are used for certain sequences, but also the, um, the fact that at the beginning of the film, we get the whole um, the, the situation of a factory, work, a factory owner who gives up his factory. And then it seems like the rest of the film is, let's say, the theorem about how could this happen? Um, how could a factory worker, a factory owner, give up his factory? And Pasolini gives us um, a, a proposition that it's it's through the visit of this um, this person who um, has sex with each of them that it's through sex that disturbs the the bourgeois family and sex seems in the film to be very much linked, which is linked to nature, to the barbaric, to, we've seen this in, in some of the other films we've talked about that, um, in Medea, um, the the earth, the, these, these images that we keep getting of Mount Etna. Um, so in that sense, maybe if we want to call this destabilization of the bourgeois, hetero, family, queer, that queerness then would be linked, would be another um, trait of, or another thing that Pasolini links to the barbaric, um, the, the primal, the... Anyway, I just wanted to, th to, I wanted to throw out my reading, my teorema. I'm not sure how it's connected to the, the two kinds of film stock. It's not, I just... Yeah, I thought that was a really clever thing to throw in. I just, <laughs> no, it's not. It, it's, but I do think there's something in an analysis that we would offer of the film that I think to, that 
would be something to think about the, the beginning section that's um, played out like a silent film with a different film stock that then it shifts. It's not, it's not black and white, it's a kind of sepia, and then it shifts into it's, color. It's also very 1968. European festival art cinema, isn't it? Well, if you if you see it in the states and you can, then you don't have the subtitles. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, no, it's just a uh, um, fascinating discussion, and uh, having seen the film after your talk and listening to the discussion, I actually almost feel an urge to go back and start timing the episodes and looking at the at the soundtrack a little bit more closely, but also looking at spaces. Uh, the, 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 just two notes, um, sort of footnotes to things that have already been said. The, the first book, um, Darren Stamp is reading on the terrace of the villa is, a, uh, is an urban planning manual. It's a, an Italian language handbook for urban planning. And then he puts it away and picks up, picks up Rambo. Um, and the other interesting thing is the burial site of Emilio, which is actually a construction site for a new apartment development of the kind of, uh, you know, that, that were built all throughout Italy, northern Italy, but Rome, uh, precisely at the, at the boundaries of the cities. Um, and we've discussed this in, in, in earlier points in this, in this series. This is a, a space that is of particular importance to Pasolini. Um, existentially, but artistically as well. The, the peripheral space of the growing city, um, where basically the new, uh, you know, bourgeois, the bourgeoisified uh, society, where the, where the proletariat gets sucked into the, the new consumerist society. Uh, that's the space where that happens. Um, but it's also the space of promise for him and in a way also of sexual adventure. That's like the space where he found the Neto Um So it's probably no coincidence that that is where Emilio goes to have herself buried. Uh, and there will be a building built on top of her. So I just want to throw that out there as a, a possible avenue for another reading that I think would be very much in line with what you have so far proposed. Yeah, as a, a portrait of Milan, there's a lot of creative geography going on, but I think your point is really valid. I mean, if I'd had more time when I was there in June, I would have tried to figure out more of the locations. I mean, I did the basic thing, the toilet and the train station. But, but this, this mansion with a tram line attached to it, I mean, God only knows where that is, and, you know, other serious questions. Uh, in terms of the soundtracks, the soundtracks are very spatially specific as well. Yeah. I mean, as yeah. soon as uh, uh, Emilio leaves the house, all you ever get are uh, church bells in the distance, which is a very accurate description of the soundscape in northern in the northern Italy countryside. That's what it, I know. It, that's what it sounds like there. But it's definitely not an urban space, and so uh, yeah, it's just. In terms of music, it's also sound. I mean, the very beginning, we get the, the if you follow the idea, the barbaric, the earth, the nature, and Ennio Morricone. You know, so we have this contrast right away, or we have this bringing of the barbaric together with, with contemporary in a kind of jazzy Morricone score. And then when he switches to the contemporary story, first you have the, the factory stuff, but then when he switches, to the family in the kind of silent movie-esque thing, as I read it, the music changes. We don't get Morricone anymore. It's only when it goes into color that he comes back. Or at least we don't get the same, it's still Morricone, but we don't get that same jazzy pop, like um, contemporary sound. Just more stuff for the analysis. Um, well, um, we don't have to push it to one in the morning, like we usually do. Um, I think midnight is good. Um, Tom, I said again at the beginning, and I'm just going to repeat again, that, that um, it is a shame that, that we just have one queer talk so that all of the queer burden gets placed on Tom's reading um, to explain everything. 
Which well, one? I hear you're going to add a, a lecture on Arabian Nights, is that right, Vincent? Oh. <laughs> okay, but um, but you opened up so many different aspects for talking about queerness in his work, and for that, I think we're all very appreciative. Um, thank you, thank you all for staying and discussing, and thank you, Tom Waugh. Thank you. Thank you. Natürlich der Hinweis, jetzt sind zwar Semesterferien, aber die Lecturerei geht weiter und zwar am 16. April, wenn mich nicht alles täuscht. Regine Prange wird dann den Vortrag halten und über Edipo reden. Ja, ich wünsche Ihnen einen guten Nachhauseweg und gucken Sie auch gerne mal in den anderen Film rein. Bis dann. Tschüss.